Okay, so here you see my name uh, written if you did not understand it. Uh, and what you see here is an area view of our campus in Augsburg. Uh, our department, I think, is not visible here, uh, but anyhow. So the course is called Atomist Atomistic Modeling for Microstructure Evolution. And basically, I want to speak about the physics behind it, which we need, and of course also about the impl implementation. Why do we do computer simulation? I mean, as I understood, most of you are already more or less in the field, so it's probably known to you. Uh, there are a couple of reasons to do computer simulations instead of experiments. Uh, I wrote a couple of, of points here. Sometimes it's just easier than experiments, uh, but often it's also faster. So it's a point of view also very important for application. I mean, you all know Volkswagen constructs a new car. They construct it basically on the computer first, do all the crash tests on the computer, and then only after this was successful, they go to real, uh, to the factory. Same here, uh, some price issue issues. And the reason for this is that we can control everything on an atomic scale. That's what this course is about here. Uh, we can look into details. I mean, with nowadays, that's why I like this electron microscopy that much. You can also see single atoms there. So you can control the atoms, but even not on a very realistic conditions sometimes. Yeah? So in here on the computer, you precisely control the, the conditions under which you do your in quotation mark experiments. So I was on the, on the list of advantages of, uh, of computer simulations, computer experiments, even sometimes people call it. Uh, and one point I did not yet mention is that you can also access situations which are experimentally not available, yeah? which you cannot access. You can put two atoms on, on one, one place or so. Yeah? I mean, this would be a bit stupid, but uh, uh, other situations can be very important. And you can precisely control what you are doing, hopefully, I mean, if your code is, is correctly. Uh, so what we see here on the left side is a, a, a computer simulation. It looks like an ant or so uh, of electron density. That's a very big part of computer simulations, electron structure calculations, uh, which we do not mention here. So this is out of our scope. This would just be too much here. Uh, but once in a while, I will mention it because, of course, it's a very important and, and basic technique to do electronic structure calculations uh, because electrons are responsible for all types of bindings and so on in the crystal. Uh. So the reason why we give this course and why many people are interested in it, uh, but how do we do it? And especially atomistic computer simulations. Beside, of course, there are many other, other ways, uh, all kinds of co continuum simulations where you neglect the atomic structure, which has lots of advantages, but also certain disadvantages because our materials consist of atoms and very often it's getting important. So if we look at the atoms, yeah, the atoms, they somehow move, whatever controls their motion. But then they also interact with other atoms. I mean, single atoms, they are a bit boring. Uh, so we are mostly interested not in single atoms, uh, which would also mean perhaps gases, uh, but in interacting atoms. So how do we describe the interaction between atoms, which then controls the evolution of such a solid? Yeah, we have forces between these atoms, and this will be one of the next chapters here to understand these forces. Uh, but very often when I speak with younger students, I ask them what, what controls, for example, binding in a molecule. They tell me, yeah, forces. And I tell them, forces is not the most elementary thing. Yeah? Uh, it's better to speak of energies. Energy is a, yeah, I would say, more elementary concept in physics as forces. Yeah? Forces, yeah, I call it naive here. Some, sometimes are a bit naive. For example, if you speak with chemists, 
You ask them why do uh, sodium and chlorine form a molecule or a uh, solid. And they tell you, yeah, because uh, the, the atoms want to fill the shells and the others want to uh, get closed shells by removing an electron. But that's not a real uh, explanation, yeah? Uh, yeah why, why do the electrons want to fill the shell? They have no brain or so, yeah? So there's some energy argument behind it, yeah? And of course, if you know a bit about quantum mechanics, uh, there are good arguments why this is a reasonable concepts, but just to speak about forces or will of, of whatever objects uh, to do some things, it's not sufficient. So we need energy models. And very often the interaction, the energy between two neighboring atoms or of one atom in a crystal with another atom in the crystal follows a roughly such a shape here. So if you consider the distance here, First of all, they don't feel each other. There is no interaction if they are far enough away from each other. But then if they get closer, you get an attraction. Negative energy always means binding. Positive energy or increase in energy means kind of repulsion. So this, is, this would go here. And here you have this very strong repulsion. This is typical because when the atoms get too close, the electron clouds say they, they uh, are repulsive, uh, or the, uh, there are also quantum mechanical arguments, but very naively said, the positive charge of the, of the nuclei uh, leads to repulsion. That's why this typically always looks like this. So if we uh, look here, we would expect that these two atoms, they approach each other until they find a kind of minimum here. Yeah? So that's a very simple way to look at interactions. We will look closer to it uh, in, uh, in one of the next lectures. Yeah. So somewhere you find an equilibrium pos position which has minimal energy. And the, as you probably know from basic physics lectures, the gradient of the energy are the forces. So here you get a, a force in this direction, uh, or yeah, positive force, no, negative force here. Here you have a positive force, a propulsive force. The slope here changes uh, around the minimum. Also, here in this minimum, you can have vibrations. So for whatever reason, the, can, the atom can slightly uh, approach or um, leave this equilibrium position. This is what, what we know from you know, atomic molecular vibrations or, uh, or um, crystal vibrations. So that's you know, basically what I already said. The atoms and the energy uh, interactions, the, the energy between control the energy as uh, an equilibria, the minima of the energy, and the forces between the atoms. And uh, as we will see, this is behind molecular dynamics. So here are very simple examples. Uh, I, I took from the example uh, folder in, in LUMPS, which exploits this. Uh, this principle, uh, you have a set of atoms with a well-defined set of interaction energies or forces in between. And then you can start the computer uh, integrating Newton's equation of motion, we will see all this, to study interesting phen phenomena. Or here another example, also taken from this example folder, showing the deposition of some atoms on top of a surface here of a crystal. Uh, you see here the, the motion. We will see later on what temperature or how temperature comes into the game here. Yeah? Temperature is, uh, two of you are, have a physics background uh, as far as I understood. Uh, perhaps you remember that temperature is one of the most complicated uh, concepts in physics. Yeah? Uh, when I was a student, a professor told us uh, that the temperature is the integrating denominator of entropy, no, of, of heat. Yeah? And this was in my third or fourth semester, so I did not understand the word. It took me 10 years or so to really understand what he meant. Yeah? Uh, it's not the way I would introduce temperature in a lecture. But. So this was uh, were examples of uh, molecular dynamic simulations, very simple examples. Uh, 
And here are some simple examples, uh, old programs I wrote, I don't know, 20 year or 30 years ago, uh, of Monte Carlo simulations. In molecular dynamics, what we do is we consider all, this, uh, all the forces between all types of atoms. In typical uh, Monte Carlo simulations, we put the atoms on a rigid lattice and then allow them, according to some rules, to jump back and forth. Huh? And doing so, perhaps I should go back here, doing so, uh, you can just consider a very simple example. You put two different metals in contact. Perhaps you know it from any lab course. They start to interdiffuse. That's what we see here. Uh, the red atoms jump into the blue, the blue atoms jump into the red. And that's what we know from diffusion. It forms a profile. That's the error function which forms here. You could fit an error function. We just summed up here the number of red atoms in each row. Here it's one, here it's zero. And in between, you form this, this nice uh, error function profile, so the integrated Gaussian. Yeah? Uh, yeah. I did it here on both sides. So you see how it evolves. We could wait for some time. And the algorithm here is extremely simple. You allow, in this case, blue and red atoms to interchange their places according to a randomly chosen probability. Yeah? And this probability would follow a temperature. So you could adjust the temperature here. I will show it in the next slide. Uh, and study what happens if you raise the temperature below the temperature and so on. Here that's a bit boring. Uh, temperature uh, would just scale the time. But here in the next example, what I did here is a similar, it's a two-dimensional uh, system here with two species of atoms. First they are at high temperature, so the atoms jump, uh, but do nothing special. But now I lowered the temperature on the, on the computer. You see that they start to form kind of clusters here. Yeah? Not really stable. Now I lowered the temperature even further. Uh, and you form clusters, precipitates. Yeah? And this is what metallurgists are often interested in. Now if you lower the temperature even further, you see that you freeze in the motion. Yeah? Nothing more happens. Maybe I should go through it again. OK, here is a homogeneous state, high temperature. Now if you slightly lower the temperature, you form these pre-clusters. That's always where it is interrupted. And if you lower the temperature even further, you get these nice precipitates. But you can even see the Ostwald ripening. Perhaps you know uh, that small clusters disappear on the cost of larger ones. Yeah? So you still have an exchange of atoms between these different clusters here. And then if you go even further, you freeze in the kinetics. Uh, not very much happens anymore. And then if you raise the temperature, you can homogenize again. And all this code here is, yeah, I would say the physics in the code is not more than 20 lines probably. Yeah? The rest is the graphics and uh, setting up and everything. Yeah? So this is a very simple thing. And if you like, I can share this, this code. Uh, it's written in Fortran, uh, as I said, at least 20 years ago, if not 30 years ago. Uh, but also to warn you, I mean, Fortran is sometimes considered as a very oldish uh, uh, computer language. So there are much more modern concepts like Python or so, C++, all this object-oriented thing and so on. Uh, but the big advantage of languages like Fortran is that since they are pretty simple, it's easy for a compiler to optimize the code. So to get highly optimized code, still people lot, uh, use a lot of Fortran codes yeah? in, in uh, heavy numerical applications. I mean, these are also advanced versions of Fortran. Uh, this is both Fortran 77. Uh, normally, these versions are named after the year. So this is when I started university, 77. Uh, 
and I think I started learning computer uh, with, with punch cards uh, and then with uh, huge magnetic disks. I still have a magnetic disk in my office of this size. Uh, I think it had two megabyte uh, and there's a big scratch on it which was my diploma thesis or the data of my diploma thesis. Uh, you always had these troubles which are fortunately become very rare. But as I said, these simple languages, they have their advantages. And for heavy numerical work, often Fortran and C uh, is faster than, than yeah, uh, these modern languages. And especially in, in particular, Python uh, has this disadvantage that it is not a compiled but a, a interpreted language. So the computer translates it on, on time. Uh, which, of course, to costs some, some computer time. Okay, so I said, what do we need? We need the interaction in energies. So we need a physical model behind uh, to get the forces between the atoms. Uh, you know that uh, yeah, there are typical, uh, different types of, of bonds. Uh, Ionic bonds, covalent, oh, of covalent bonds, metallic bonds, and so on. They all depend on electronic interactions. So if you want to go very deeply into it, you have to describe the electronic interactions. This is typically done using you know, the standard method is called DFT, uh, density functional theory. There are variants of it uh, where you try to minimize the uh, uh, the density of the electrons on, on certain locations. But so that's also very heavy. Uh, it requires a lot of computer time, so you're very limited what you can do with it. So here I, I uh, noted it. Uh, yeah, often these are called first principle uh, methods, these DFT methods. I think there are variants, but basically, if you sp speak of first principles or up initio, uh, you speak of density functional theory. <coughs> so what you do there is to compute the, the total electronic energy in the system. There are a couple of codes. I think up init is free, quantum espresso is free, mean 2K and VASP uh, are, uh, you have to pay for. And there are a couple of more each with its certain advantages and disadvantages, but all of them very heavy and time consuming. So you can do it only for limited size and limited time, if time at all comes into the, the play. Yeah? <coughs> Next step would be what we typically do in molecular dynamics, that we do not calculate the total electronic energy. I mean, if you know the total energy, uh, you can displace the atoms slightly, then you also have the gradients of the energy, then you have the forces. There is something which is called ab initio molecular dynamics, where you do the electronic calculation and then do slight displacements of the atom and so on. That's not what we are planning to do here. So in typical molecular dynamics applications, what we use are so-called phenomenological potentials. So we try to fit the interaction energy uh, to some parameters. Uh, you can use either experimental data uh, or DFT data. DFT is an abbrevi abbreviation for density functional theory. And we are, uh, the simplest one, I will also discuss it here, is the Leonard-Jones potential. Uh, pretty old one. I think it originates from the 50s or so. Uh, this is very suitable because you can precisely control the parameters of this potential. It's a toy model, yeah? and like always with toys, you can play. Yeah? Uh, but it's not a realistic description of solids, except perhaps uh, what people always claim for uh, noble gas crystals. But to be honest, noble cr gas crystals also are not that important for material scientists. A more refined type of, of interaction are the so-called EAM 
or embedded atom method potentials, uh, which allow uh, to Im implement also many body interactions. The shortcoming, one of the shortcomings of this Leonard Joan and, and simple pair potentials is <coughs> that they don't include uh, third partners in this interaction. Yeah? In this simple example which I showed, where you have the two atoms interacting, this might depend on the third atom which is sitting here, yeah? or maybe even in between. Yeah? Clear. Yeah? Uh, and this is completely excluded uh, in these simple pair potentials like Leonard Jones, uh, but to some extent included in the EIM method. And the enhanced versions, the so-called so modified EAM. I will also explain what it is. And uh, yeah, the EAM and MEAM, they are in particular useful for metals. And since I have a metal, um, or physical metallurgy background, that's what I am interested in. Interested in. Uh, but for other applications, there are other types of, of, uh, of interaction potentials. Tersov, for example, is for semiconductors, uh, I think a good one. Uh, and then in, there is a lot of applications in biophysics, biomolecular uh, science, biochemistry, where you want to understand the fol folding of proteins, for example. There you need other types of potentials. And that's also one of the problems uh, we have to face and we have to be aware of uh, in molecular dynamics applications of these, these potentials, that they always have a certain limited range of validity. Yeah? So for example, if you want to study the transition of carbon uh, from, from sp2 binding from, from coal uh, into diamond, which is sp3 binding, uh, I think there's no potential reflecting this properly, yeah? or this is very artificial, because the electronic structure strongly changes. And tacitly, we assume, in applying these, these type of, of potentials, that the electronic structure does not change too much. Yeah? In, in biomolecular simulations, you also have to be aware that this type of, of interaction might change depending on the situation, on the surrounding, uh, for example, a simple thing like water, yeah? uh, apparently simple, a simple thing like water is very difficult to simulate uh, because you have the intermolecular binding inside the molecule, <coughs> which is partly ionic, partly covalent, and then you have the dipolar interaction uh, between the molecules, and all this in principle you would have to take into account if you want to simulate uh, just water dropping out from the water tap. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one of the difficult points and a big part of applications and also of uh, uh, work spent uh, in biophysics is in developing new force fields and, and realistic force fields for these applications. On the other side, of course, it's, it's a very, uh, very important part. I mean, we all learned about this uh, during the pandemic, uh, and I was really amazed how, how well they could predict uh, these, these variations of the virus, uh, which, uh, what is it, uh, uh, which, which part of the DNA change or RNA changed uh, in, in which way, uh, so that this virus uh, can better attack us during these all, all these uh, variations. <coughs> so that's typically what we do in molecular dy dynamics. Uh, and then in Monte, Monte Carlo, uh, the simplest way at least is to apply just pair, what we call pair exchange energies. Uh, so if you are on a rigid lattice, you have different types of atoms and you can yeah, calculate the energy, how much does it cost if I change uh, an A into a B or if I exchange these two, two atoms. Yeah? <coughs> this is uh, at least the simplest way to do molecular, uh, Monte Carlo simulations. <coughs> and I will show later on examples, uh, Guru 
told about uh, in early 2000 or so when we, we, we when we did all these Monte Carlo thing, we used very simple models, uh, which of course have limited range of applicability. So the transfer to real systems is always a bit questionable, but it allows again to study things in detail which you cannot, could not study uh, in, in experiment. Yeah. <coughs> Here shows this, this Leonard Jones potential, which has this shape as I already showed, uh, and it has just two parameters, uh, A and B. So it's a power 12 and a power minus 12, power minus 6 uh, function of the, diff, uh, of the distance between the atoms here. This power 12 uh, has no real justification. It was just chosen because it's so simple to, to work with it. Yeah? Uh, it reflects this, this deep increase here. The power minus 1, 6 is the attractive part here. That's why it has a minus sign here. This parameter A describes the depth of the potential and the parameter B, uh, the, the spatial scaling here. So that's, the, on the one hand, the big advantage of this potential. It is so simple. I will, uh, in one of the next lectures, I will explain it a bit more in detail, what you can get out of it. Uh, but of course, it's also the disadvantage that it is not very realistic. So what do we need further? I mean, when we do our computer, experiments or computer simulations, we obtain a huge amount of data. Fortunately, with today's uh, hard disks, it's not such a big problem anymore. Uh, as I said, in the early 2000s, one had to be very careful not to fill the disk with too much data, so to somehow economically store it. Uh, but once you have the data, what do you can get out of it. And there are a couple of things where it can, it can be applied and what it can be useful. Uh, first of all, uh, we can get equilibrium structures. So we have certain uh, atoms, types of atoms, and we don't know which crystal structure is the most stable one, for example. But to be honest, uh, MD and MC, of course, not, uh, MD is not the best tool to do this. Yeah? This you better do with DFT, because with DFT, your, your energies are pretty good, yeah? while in MD, it's always a question of luck. What is more interesting are defect structures, yeah? core structures of grain boundaries, which are then very important for segregation or for grain boundary mobility, for grain growth, and all these things. Yeah? And that's already difficult with DFT, uh, because systems have to be too large uh, in many cases. Uh, same for dislocations. A dislocation has a core, uh, and it has a far field. Uh, this far field you can describe easily with, with uh, elasticity, but the core, you don't get it. Uh, and the core structure also is important for the mobility. Uh, and also for things like uh, segregation to this dislocation and so on. And this is, these are the typical applications uh, for MD simulations, defect structures, but also defect energies and defect properties. We will see also uh, a vacancy or a, a, a substitutional uh, for an atom uh, or an interstitial or so. They all have certain energies. And these energies then control properties like, like diffusion properties. Yeah? But same, of course, for grain boundaries or for dislocations, uh, dislocation core energies, dislocation uh, grain boundary energies, and so on. They are all important quantities. Then, uh, where DFT has a very hard time, uh, but which is easy in molecular dynamics, you can get thermodynamic quantities. The reason is DFT basically is at zero Kelvin. Yeah? And more or less artificially, you can plug in temperature to it. As I said, temperature is a complicated thing. Yeah? In MD, yeah, you don't get the temperature for free, but at a low price, I would say. Yeah? So, uh, and 
if you raise the temperature, as you saw, uh, you can change the stability of phases. Uh, everybody knows and uh, come to this later on. Yeah? So, and, and what controls this are the free energies. So by applying certain tricks we will learn here, uh, you can obtain free energies. And free energy is something different than energy. As I said, this will be part of the next lecture here. What you also get, yeah, OK, I have it here. Uh, uh, what I call kinetic properties, yeah? uh, how much energy is required to shift an atom to a neighboring place. Yeah? So the activation energy for diffusion, uh, these are also very important quantities you can get out of it. And then uh, another important thing you get out from MD are vibrational properties. Yeah? At, even at low temperature, at zero Kelvin, atoms vibrate. That's a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but normally we are not interested at these very low temperatures, but at normal temperatures, like here in the room, then you have vibration of the atoms. And uh, in the language of, of quantum mechanics, these are phonons. Uh, and these phonons say they have what we call a phonon spectrum. Uh, they have certain energies, certain wavelengths. <coughs> so one can easily compute phonon spectra using molecular dynamics. And closely related to this are the vibrational entropies. Uh, if the atoms start to vibrate, you create some kind of disorder. And disorder is more or less uh, equivalent to entropy. So this also contributes to free energies. And very important also, uh, for example, if you consider a vacancy, uh, this will probably change the vibration spectrum of atoms around it. So the vacancy has a particular energy, but also a particular entropy. Yeah? Particular, of course, it has a configurational entropy, which one should not confuse, but it also has a vibrational entropy. The atoms perhaps vibrate a bit stronger into the vacant site as they would do in the crystal. These are all things we can get out from, from uh, MD simulations. And then, as I already mentioned, uh, you can get important input for kinetics. Uh, using MD, you can calculate the energy required to push an atom from one side to another side, so to make a diffusion jump. I will explain the, the tools one could apply there. By the way, I managed on the weekend <laughs> to, to get this NEB running. And uh, where we come to the limits of MD, but where the power of MC comes in, transformation kinetics. Uh, in molecular dynamics, we are restricted in time. I come to this in more detail later on. Uh, Typically, you can do simula run simulations, even you, if you run them for days or weeks. Uh, they describe times of nanoseconds and microseconds at most. Yeah? So very fast phenomena. Yeah? So only very fast phase transformations can be described using MD. Yeah? For example, martensitic transformations, this is something which occurs with the velocity of sound. This is feasible, but these unmixing reactions I showed in this simple uh, MC model, you, you cannot describe in, in MD. Then you have to switch over to MC, uh, all kinds of uh, more complicated or more slow uh, phase transformations. There you have to go to MC, Monte Carlo simulations. The reason will be visible during this lecture. So transformation kinetics and, yeah, please. I, I mean, the limitation is always given by the time and by the size of your system. Yeah? So if the transformation takes place in your simulation volume, which is, yeah, I would say, realistically in MD, like perhaps one million of atoms, uh, so that's a grain of 100 by 100 by 100 atoms, uh, so 40 nanometers or so cube, small grain. If the transformation takes place in this volume in the time of microseconds at most, I mean, microseconds is always quite ambitious. 
then you can do it in MD. But as you know, I mean, the velocity of sound is uh, in solids like several thousand meters per second. Uh, if such a transformation migrates with this velocity, then you can do it. Uh, for solidification, uh, you have another problem. Uh, you, since time is so short, you often don't have the time for nucleation. I don't know, I mean, here in India, this phenomenon is probably not that well known. Uh, in Germany, we have cold winters, yeah? and in former times, maybe this winter as well, uh, when you had no heating, and people had uh, the washing water <laughs> on, on, on a table. Yeah? Then it was an undercooled liquid when you got up, and then you dig your hand in and froze in a moment. Yeah? Or sa same sometimes happens uh, on parties, uh, if you don't have a refrigerator, it's usual to put the, the drinks outside on the balcony. Yeah? And if it is in winter, uh, sometimes it happens that uh, typically with beer, if you, <laughs> uh, if you open it, it suddenly freezes very rapidly yeah? because it's an undercooled liquid. And the same happens in, in molecular dynamics. You always have to struggle uh, with undercooling if you want to study such a solidification phenomenon. Uh, you have a critical nuclear size, which is not very small. And since your system is small, uh, you have to, you know, problems to form a large enough nucleus. There are tricks around it, but uh, that's one of the limitations, I would say. I, I'm not sure whether this was your question, but at least I answered some something. Are, are there any more questions? Uh, go ahead if you're curious about anything. I mean, still we have 10 minutes time of this introduction. Yeah, I think, but, but this is the case, I think, mostly because one of the fitting parameters for the potential is the equilibrium parameter. But for example, what you can study is the increase in lattice parameter if you alloy. Yeah? Uh, if you put copper into aluminum, you slightly decrease the lattice parameter. These are things you can very well study. Or the thermal expansion, uh, I will show examples for this. Uh, this fits well, we, again, some not 20 years ago, but 10 years ago, we developed the potential for a strange system. Uh, what was it? Tungsten thor thorium. Uh, for some good reasons we were interested in. And there you could study the, the thermal expansion, for example. And it fits pretty well to the experimental values. Uh, this is in uh, constant energy, uh, constant volume, uh, constant number of, of particles. Uh, I mean, if you exchange atoms, this means that you conserve the number of atoms of each species. Uh, if you work on a rigid lattice, it's a constant volume. Uh, and then you have, uh, no, sorry, it's not constant energy, it's constant temperature. Okay, so like in a canonical arc. Yeah. But we come to all these, these points and how to go from one ensemble to another one. So, yeah, I, I, I already mentioned these points. Uh, what are the typical time scales? I'm not sure whether all of you are familiar with this. Uh, and, and this basically controls also the type of simulation you can do. Uh, the typical time scale of electrons in a solid is in the femtosecond range. Yeah? So the, yeah. Uh, time to, for an electron to jump from one uh, position to another or from level to another one is in femtoseconds. Yeah? Uh, atomic vibrations, uh, and that's what we obtain in, in, in molecular dynamics, are in the picosecond range. So a factor of 1,000 slower than what we have in, in electrons. Yeah? But still, if you want to sample these, these vibrations step by step in molecular dynamics, you must have time steps which are far sl smaller 
uh, than these picoseconds. So typically you do molecular dynamic sim simulations with femtosecond time steps just to precisely sample these motion of atoms. Yeah. But then the atomic jumps in a solid, uh, this strongly depends on temperature, can be on a second or even larger time scale. Yeah? Uh, I think the jumping frequency of carbon in iron at room temperature is at about one second. Yeah? There is a nice experiment showing this. Uh, I don't know whether you ever heard about the snook effect. Uh, when I was a student, we had a lab course where the snook effect was studied. It's a relaxation or the, uh, if you, I, 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 I guess you know that carbon sits on interstitial sites, octahedral interstitial sites in BCC iron and in alpha iron. Uh, and then if you pull the crystal in, in one direction, uh, these, these interstitial sites become non-equivalent. Yeah? So the atoms jump into particular sites. Yeah? And this can be measured. Uh, and from this, you can determine the jump rate uh, of, of the carbon atoms in the solid. This is important because this means uh, that on a time scale longer than many seconds, carbon tends to diffuse somewhere. And this can be also measured. Uh, it goes to dislocations, segregates and dislocations. And then if we deform, uh, these dislocations have to uh, have to leave the, this cloud of, of, of carbon atoms. Uh, that's this uh, upper yield point uh, which you observe experimentally. So that's the motion of, of atoms here. But normally, especially for, uh, for substitutional diffusion, it's even much slower. Uh, or you have to raise the temperature far higher to, uh, to get any motion of atoms. Uh, again, it's a kind of naive uh, approach, which I also tried when I was younger. Uh, if you prepare an alloy, yeah, you never are sure whether the con uh, composition is, is the same on one side or the other side. Yeah? So you put it into a furnace at elevated temperature, and you think it will diffuse from one side to the other side, and, and you get an homogeneous distribution. This is completely stupid. Yeah. Uh, so you get diffusion distances, I think, on one of the next slides, perhaps I calculated. You get diffusion distances, perhaps, of micrometers or so, yeah? uh, not of centimeters. Perhaps millimeter, depends on temperature. Yeah, uh, this is what is written here. Uh, for diffusion, you need very long times. Yeah? Uh, I mean, of course, for technical diffusion, if you want to do a precipitation reaction, you want to harden aluminum, uh, it must be done in, say, half an hour or so, or two hours. Yeah? Uh, nobody hardens an alloy, not, not nobody, but few people, uh, over a time of a year or so. Yeah? But still, this happens. Uh, yeah. Okay, I should not uh, talk too much. Uh, in aluminum, there is a strange situation. You, you all know uh, there is an important class of aluminum alloys, the 2000 series, which contains some copper, and this hardens at room temperature. And if you calculate using the diffusion coefficients, it should not happen, yeah? even not in years. Yeah? And it only happens because you have an excess of vacancies, uh, which uh, accelerates the diffusion. Okay, here, ah, here's the slide I, uh, where I calculated diffusion, I forgot for which situation, uh, ah, here, copper and copper. So the diffusion coefficient of copper and copper uh, at different temperatures, here uh, at elevated temperature, here at room temperature, uh, the diffusion coefficient can be looked up or whatever, it's given here. And then from the diffusion coefficient using this simple Einstein relation, Einstein was busy in many fields, uh, you can calculate the jump rate, so how often does an atom jump per time. Uh, so here you find pretty high jump rates, here it's very low. Uh, and yeah, the diffusion time or the inverse of this jump rate. And from this one can calculate the diffusion distances here. This is what I did here. Uh, 
after uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, you get a diffusion distance of um, roughly a micrometer here at 650 Celsius, uh, several micrometer at higher temperature, but at room temperature, uh, you get uh, an angstrom displacement, which is not a realistic displacement because it's not a lattice constant, less than a lattice constant, yeah. On the other side, uh, here I, I marked some typical distances we are interested in. Yeah? Uh, so elastic displacements, yeah, they are perhaps tens of hundreds of a lattice constant here. So they are in the range of uh, tens or hundreds angstrom. Uh, here atomic distances, I guess you know, are in the angstrom range. That's why we have this strange unit of angstrom because it fits well the crystal uh, lattice size. Uh, but precipitates already, you know, the typical precipitate and peak hardened alloy is in the range of you know, 50 nanometer perhaps. And this is already large compared to these distances here. Yeah? The polycrystal grain, uh, if it is not a nanocrystalline material, oops. Okay, here I, I roughly calculated how many atoms uh, we have in a, in a sphere of 50 nanometer or 50 micrometer uh, diameter. So here you have a million atoms. Uh, a million atoms for molecular dynamics is feasible, uh, but 10 to 15 atoms would be in a 50 micrometer sphere. That's beyond everything. Yeah? So even with supercomputers, no chance. Yeah? With molecular, um, with Monte Carlo, Perhaps you have a bit larger crystals possible, but most, mostly the time scale is better. And again, you, you don't have uh, realistic grain sizes in a polycrystal. Yeah? You have only nanocrystalline materials which you can study. So I summarize here uh, what, we, what we can do with these different types of, of simulations. Few atoms, nanoseconds perhaps, uh, millions of atoms, microseconds, Monte Carlo, millions of atoms, and long time. Yeah? And this controls what you can do, what you can apply it for. And yeah, what is not possible, of course, everything which is not covered by these time and uh, uh, space scales. Okay, so I have a brief overview about this lecture here. I don't know whether we should go through it. Uh, this was the introduction uh, we just gave here. Then. Uh, after this lecture, the second lecture will be starting with an introduction into thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, all the things we need to understand the, the tricks applied in MD and MC later on. Uh, this will be two lectures, one here and, and, and the second one tomorrow. Uh, so I, I don't know at which point I stop here. Uh, somehow I will switch from this to this. Uh, and then this afternoon, as Guru said, there will be the possibility to write a very simple Monte Carlo code uh, to get a bit accustomed to these, these tricks and so on. Uh, I don't know whether you, anybody, is anybody among you who ever used Fortran? Ah, oh, okay. Congratulations, <laughs> great. <laughs> these are skills which are going to get lost. Yeah? I don't know, you, you know this computer language COBOL? Uh, this was also in the 60s or so. This was uh, commercial, uh, commercial business oriented language or something like this. And there's still, I think, a huge amount of code written in this COBOL code and nobody can, can manage it anymore. Yeah? So these people have very good chances to get good jobs in banks or insurance companies. Yeah? Okay, then, uh, yeah, already tomorrow, uh, in the second lecture, we will start with MD, uh, the basic ideas and so on. And uh, the tutorial will then give an introduction to this. I think we basically use this lumps code here. Uh, and as I mentioned, then the third day, uh, very important, the interatomic potentials, uh, what types of we, we use, I would say. And then I continue, uh, this goes into the direction you mentioned, uh, the basics of MD, 
uh, Thomas Stetson Barrows that so, so how, how can we switch from one ensemble to another ensemble? Uh, as we will see, the standard, or if you do nothing special, you work with an NVE, particle number conserved, volume conserved, energy conserved ensemble, which is not the best choice. I mean, typically in experiments, we control the pressure. Yeah, we have ambient pressure also, uh, and we control the temperature, not the energy. Yeah? So somehow we have to switch on. That's what this, this, this lecture about. Then there will be a lecture given by Guru on elastic moduli and lattice parameters. Uh, melting points, I already mentioned this, this complication. Phonons, so uh, starting from here, I would think it's more going into application of these, these tools. Yeah? Phonon spectra, uh, uh, vibrational properties and so on. And these free energies, uh, phase transformations, using M MD, uh, yeah, deformation of materials, uh, which is also an interesting application. So you can compress your crystal in an MD simulation, uh, look how dislocations are created or how they interact with other defects and so on. Uh, diffusion, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this, this has, has been shifted upwards. So I slightly changed the schedule here. And then here's a thermodynamic integration, so how to obtain uh, these free energies, basically. And then uh, here, so week, next week, we start with introduction into Monte Carlo. So different ways to do, set up a Monte Carlo code residence time and so on. Uh, then there are hybrid uh, ways to do it. Uh, you can introduce Monte Carlo elements into a molecular dynamics simulation uh, because the time scale in molecular dynamics is so limited and yeah, by uh, plugging in uh, some, some Monte Carlo uh, tools you can accelerate it or then there is an interesting uh, alternative uh, for the interaction energies in, molecular, uh, in Monte Carlo, uh, so-called ATAT. Uh, what is it? Alloy theoretical automatic tool. Uh, it's a tool set which allows to derive interaction parameters, realistic interaction parameters from, for Monte Carlo, stress effects, and so on. And then here, we are already approaching the end here, applications of molecular dynamics in Monte Carlo. Uh, so this is the rest in of next week. I think this is all I want. Oh yeah, no, there are two points missing. Uh, first are uh, yeah, where you can take further knowledge from and where we took our part of our knowledge from. Uh, there are things called books, perhaps the older among you know this, strange things. There are a couple of books. This is just a, a yeah, selection of books. This, this one is a pretty good one, but not uh, going very far uh, than the other ones here. So there's a lot of online resources. We just give a few ones here. Uh, I can learn more about these techniques. And uh, then there are, of course, very important, the software packages we use or we recommend you to use. First of all, LUMPS. Uh, that's the basic MD code we use here, or the only one. Uh, I think some of you mentioned this Gromax, course, uh, Gromax code, which is more used for molecular simulations in biophysics or so. This, uh, ATAT toolkit, uh, which is a bit special. Here's this Sparks uh, Monte Carlo software package. And then very important, uh, somehow you have to mm, evaluate your data. And there's a wonderful package called Ovito uh, to allow the visualization of your structures. Yeah? And to do a couple of evaluations as well. So you can, for example, determine the crystal structure 
uh, of a certain region. Yeah, for example, if you have a stacking fault, uh, it recognizes the stacking fault in an FCC lattice as a hexagonal HTTP region. So this is a quite nice one. Mm, so there's a small uh, complication. The version you can download is a basic version only. Uh, if you want to have the advanced features, either you have to pay or you have to download the sources and then you can com compile it uh, yourself. So from here you can download the sources. There are other uh, visualization codes, for example, Rasmul and others, VMD and so on. Uh, <coughs> I recommend this Ovito co uh, code. And then there are other ones, for example, this Atomsk, uh, which are very useful to construct structures, yeah? to set up, for example, a dislocation in a solid. Yeah? Uh, you just say dislocation here and here. So you start to define the crystal, very short and very compact. Uh, you define your crystal and you say dislocation in the middle or so, uh, and then it constructs an atomic lattice containing a dislocation. So I found it quite practical. You have to be a bit careful, but sometimes it works. And this Vesta code, I, I used to use it uh, earlier, uh, again to set up if you have more complicated structures. I mean, in metallurgy, we are lucky. Uh, typically, we deal with PCC or FCC. If we are more advanced, HCP, but often that's it. But even if you have intermetallic phases, sometimes you have a hard time to put the atoms to the right places. Uh, and with this Vesta code, you can give the crystallographic space group and everything and say, here's an atom and there is an atom, and then it constructs a crystal. So that's quite uh, uh, practical. And also you can visualize the crystal structure and so on. So it's also, it's all, I think most of them are free software, uh, except this Ovito. So these are the software codes I would recommend. Of course, there are many more uh, which can be useful. I think that's all from my side for the moment. So any questions about the introduction? I mean, the question will come. I'm sure, but uh, this was mostly an overview of what we are going to tell you here during these two weeks. And it will be quite compact and a lot of things, yeah? So I, I was really amazed what we prepared here. <laughs> okay, so now we start with the real things. And this will be a bit tough, perhaps, for some of you who hear it for the first time. If you have questions, go ahead and ask. Yeah? I mean, uh, and perhaps it's boring for others. Uh, again, then tell me, then I can proceed faster. So it's uh, what we call review of thermodynamics. Uh, what, what do we mean uh, or what we intend? Uh, and by the way, Things which are more complicated to explain, I prefer to explain them, uh, yeah, not on the blackboard, but by writing on my screen here. So I will switch uh, to a note-taking software. Uh, and I also can upload these, these notes in later on. But for the introduction, I prepared some slides. OK, so what do we know from physics? Yeah? Uh, if we have a, an object. We, we have it here, it falls down. Uh, why does it fall down? Of course, uh, as I said in the introduction, we have the attractive force from the, from the ground. Uh, but that's only part of the explanation. Uh, I would say the true explanation is it lowers its energy by falling down. Yeah? Uh, and same does this, this little ball here. It rolls down and stays at some minimum. So we minimize the mechanical energy or the gravitational energy or so. But that's not what we encounter in, in daily life. Yeah? So yeah, I, I marked here what, is, what I used to tell the students uh, in an exam or so. If they know, know nothing uh, to answer, then perhaps they could start to speak about energy. Yeah? So, uh, but that's not always sufficient. Let's look here. I mean, perhaps in India, that's not that common. Uh, but this was in last winter in my garden. <laughs> I 
that this little snow snowman, <laughs> I don't know the English term for it. So water has different states of uh, of, yeah, of phases. Uh, so at low temperature, it's ice. The elevated temperature is water, liquid water. And at even higher temperature, it's vaporizing. Uh, so where does it come from? Uh, I mean, this state of liquid water is definitely higher in energy as a state of frozen water. And the vapor is even higher in energy. So why do we go from one state to another state when we raise the temperature? Uh, the answer is, uh, and that's again an advice I give to the students, if energy is not sufficient for an explanation, try this magic word of entropy. These two together, they already uh, cover, I would say, big amount of, uh, of answers to yeah, questions in physics and material science. But what is entropy? We will see a bit later. Yeah? <coughs> and here is another very simple example. This pen falls down if you release it, but it does not jump up. Yeah? Everybody knows this situation is realistic. This situation is unrealistic. On a video, you can do it. I guess nobody among you ever saw such a strange uh, behavior. Yeah? So why, why is it so and not so? If you look at energy, it would be very easy. Yeah, you need a certain amount of, I think it's on the next slide. Uh, no. Uh, you can calculate the energy required to push up this pen. And this pen could take the energy from the ground here, would cool down the ground a little bit. Yeah? I think I did the calculation. It's 0.3 Kelvin or so, or even less. Uh, this would not violate conservation of energy. Probably you already heard these arguments. Yeah. Uh, conservation of energy is a very basic law in physics, uh, so nothing should violate it. But this process does not violate it. Yeah? If you take the energy by cooling slightly the floor and then pushing up the, the pen or by taking all the vibrations of the atoms below to push up the, the pen. Yeah? So that this is not the case, we will understand in, in one of the next slides. And to introduce into thermodynamics, we, we need a certain vocabulary. What do we have in thermodynamics? Uh, the thermodynamic systems. And we will often speak about thermodynamic systems. When I was a student, I never know, knew what is really meant by a thermodynamic system. And the answer is anything. Yeah? So whatever you consider is a thermodynamic system. This, this pen here is a thermodynamic system. Uh, our room here is a thermodynamic system. More important is how do we describe it? It's just a small part of our world. Even the whole universe can be considered as a thermodynamic system, if you like. Uh, but fortunately, we concentrate on smaller ones. And the first thing is uh, that we have to distinguish thermodynamic systems from being open or closed. What does it mean? An open system can exchange energy or particles with, with its environment. Uh, 
of course, the contrary are closed systems. What does it mean? Or oh, do you know any examples? I mean, for example, me as a living body, I'm not a closed system. I'm for sure an open system. I steadily have to uh, get food into my body, yeah? uh, so to, to put energy and also some, some matter uh, into me. If I stop this, yeah, I die and I approach thermal, equi thermal equilibrium, which means I, I become dust or so. Yeah? So uh, most systems we study are open system. Also our Earth is an open system without the steady influence uh, in, in, in influx of solar energy. Every life would, would stop here. Yeah? So, and Again, we can make it a bit larger. Uh, our planetary system is uh, could be nearly considered as a closed system. So this light exchange of matter with the surrounding and uh, probably even smaller exchange of energy uh, with the surrounding. There's all this, this question about dark energy and dark matter, which we don't know. Uh, so maybe it's more open as we as we think, as we know. Uh, but basically, it could be considered as a closed system, uh, and the whole universe probably is a closed system. Uh, but on a smaller scale, do we have any closed systems? And in reality, I would say no. Yeah? If anybody of you does experiments, for example, at low temperature. You perhaps know how difficult it is to insulate uh, uh, your, your, your experiment against uh, thermal, thermal coupling from the environment. Yeah? So to you know, get close to a closed system is extremely difficult yeah? because you, know, you have all kinds of electromagnetic energy disturbing your experiment and so on. And that's one of the nice things on computer simulations, where we can easily have a closed system. We can simulate a closed system. It's even more difficult to simulate an open system. Closed system means that we keep the number of atoms in our system uh, constant, no, atoms of each species, and that we don't put energy in or out. Huh? This is just what you what you ask. That this N V E ensemble. Yeah. And yeah. There we have to find tricks how to get open systems uh, studied. Then we have more more parameters or more more distinctions. Uh, between thermodynamic systems with single component or multi component systems. That's not that elementary as the open or closed system, uh, but as we will see later. Uh, Single component is clear if, uh, if we have a pure copper crystal, it has just a single component of sing single type of atoms. If we restrict ourselves to the atomic scale, multi component system would be, for example, an alloy. Yeah? Uh, and this distinction becomes important later on yeah, if we study, uh, for example, phase diagrams or so. And similarly, we have homogeneous and heterogeneous, or single phase and multi phase. Systems.
a homogeneous system is a single crystal of, of copper, for example. Uh, heterogeneous could be a copper crystal containing some precipitates or so. No, I think these are things known to you. Now, if you want to describe our thermodynamic systems, I, I already used some terms without uh, explaining them. We have to use some variables to characterize uh, our system. How, how do we characterize? I mean, if you, yeah, uh, we have a couple of variables which, which would characterize this, this pen here. Of course, there are things like the color or the weight. Uh, I mean, the mass would be one, one variable. Uh, the volume could be a variable. Uh, temperature, we already mentioned energy, and all these things. Yeah? So we have uh, many what we call thermodynamic variables state variables, state functions. Yeah, state variables are variables which characterize the state of a system. Yeah? Uh, so examples could be I mentioned temperature T, volume V, pressure P. Uh, there's a certain, uh, it's not a problem, uh, but typically when we teach thermodynamics, we start from gases. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I, I think this is because uh, all this, this framework of thermodynamics was developed to better understand the principles of, uh, of steam engines. Now, where they just use the compressed steam to produce uh, or to release mechanical energy. Uh, here in solid state uh, or in, in mechanics, uh, pressure is not the, the sole quantity, uh, but it's basically the stress state. Yeah? So it's a stress tensor uh, which corresponds to what is for a gas the pressure, of course. It's, by the way, uh, sometimes we need, I, I think hardly we ever come across, but sometimes I need vectors or even tensors I use to mark vectors with an underline uh, and tensors with two underlines and in elasticity you have higher rank tensors like uh, tensor of elastic constants with four underlines. So they have a simple way to represent these ranks of tensors. But there are other quantities which depending on what you are interested in uh, characterize the state of a system. For example, magnetic states, magnetization. or polarization if you are interested in dielectrics. Uh, now I'm running out of, of letters here. There's an uppercase P. So these are, and, and there are many more, depending on, on what, you, what you need. Uh, but then there are, uh, there are things like the internal energy. How much jewel does this pen here or whatever contain? Yeah? And I already mentioned the entropy. Yes. And again, many more. Uh, I will introduce some, some more in a moment. Uh, all these variables have in common uh, that they, that's why they are called state variables, that they do not depend on how I reach the state. Yeah? 
the color of this pen does not depend whether I put it from here or from the other side. Yeah? So for us, it's obvious. But sometimes, it's, uh, it's becoming important. So this is one important property of state variables. And if I make this distinction, there must be some, and fortunately few ones, which do not have this property. And I don't know whether anybody is doing cycling. If you do cycling from one point to another one, the, yeah, the effort you have to spend, the work you have to spend, not only depends on the uh, starting and the end point, but also on the path you take. And for example, if there is wind against you, uh, you have to spend more work. And typically, wind is coming from in front of you. And if you go back, the wind has turned, and you have to again go against the wind. Yeah? So the work is not a typical state variable. The work you have to spend to reach a state. I call these other variables process variables. Depend on the basically there are two. Yeah? One I already mentioned. So it's work. I have to spend to reach a certain state. And the other one is the heat, which is put in or out into my system. That's where this strange statement from my professor in, in the 70s or 80s came from, that since Heat is not a state variable, but there's a mathematical trick. If you have a variable which is not, uh, which depends on the, on the path you take, uh, that you can divide this variable by a, another quantity, and that it becomes independent of the path you take. That's what is called the integrating denominator. But as, as I said, that's a very abstract uh, concept to introduce things. Yeah. Uh, it has a, what is it called, uh, axiomatic thermodynamics, going back to a person, Kara Theodori, uh, who set up this, these ideas. Maybe I could clarify this, this distinction, yeah, if I have a state one here, and another state, I can go from here to here. And if I, if I have a state variable, for example, the volume, yeah, which changes on every step a little bit. Yeah? If this is a state variable, it does not matter whether I take this pass here or take another pass. It's just a difference between here and here. So if I go along another way here, so if I have a state variable, it's just the difference of this variable at state S2 minus the uh, value at state 1. Yeah? Or the heat, for example, which is released on my way because I'm cycling against the wind, will be different. Yeah? If I <coughs> so this means that I can uh, construct the difference in, say, in, in, in this, this quantity f of s1 
f of s2 And this means that I can obtain this difference by integrating along this path, independent of the path I choose. So I take the red one. So we can write this delta f as an integral of df along pass one. And this should be e equal to the integral along this pass two. If we have variables which do not fulfill this, this criterion uh, that we cannot, uh, that we integrate them then we cannot write v or a delta v as a sum of small dv's. Yeah? Or this would be depend then on which dv's we have to choose here. Yeah? So that's why we typically distinguish the, the small steps if we modify them. Just by, by this, this notion here, instead of this straight D, uh, we use this you know, delta here. Uh, this means this depends on the path we choose. Yeah? These are fine differences, but uh, yeah, we'll see in a moment what it, where it is becoming important. <coughs> so then we have the first law of thermodynamics. guess most of you already know it, it's just the conservation of energy uh, in its simplest formulation. It means that the amount of work you do must be compensated in exchange in, in, in heat. Or any change in internal energy, internal energy is a state variable is either caused uh, by a change in, in heat or by work performed on the system. Uh, in different sources, you find different conventions for sign. Uh, so if you are careful, you have to be careful about the signs, uh, whether you perform work on the system or whether the system performs work on the environment. And same if heat is transferred from inside or outside uh, from the system. <coughs> so how, how did I define it? I have to check here. So I think delta V, uh, delta W positive means that work is performed by the system. And delta Q positive means that heat flows into the system. The 
just realized, I think I confused again, so it is done on the system. Okay, so these are very simple uh, things which are probably familiar to all of you. But don't forget how surprising it was. I think it was in the 18th century when this war law was first stated before people were not aware that such a conservation exists. So if we do mechanical work, oh, Apparently, all these, these uh, projector and, and OBS and so on uh, consumes a lot of uh, electricity. Yeah, yeah. So we'll take a break.